Hello, I'm Mark Freestead with today's Daily Hope on Acts chapter 13. Acts 13 is an incredibly consequential chapter in the Bible because it records the beginning of Paul's first missionary journey. You might remember back in Acts chapter 9 that Jesus said to Ananias, a disciple in Damascus, Saul, or Paul, was going to be his instrument to proclaim the gospel to the Gentiles and their kings and to the people of Israel. Well, now, a few chapters later in chapter 13, that's about to happen. And it's going to start a pattern that we'll see uh, that holds true in Paul's early missionary journeys. Now, the Bible tells us that while Paul and Barnabas were in Antioch with the other prophets and teachers, they were praying, they were fasting, and the Holy Spirit clearly told them to set aside Saul and Barnabas for the work. And from here until the end of Acts, the text is filled with incredibly specific details about the cities and villages that they visited right up until the time of Paul's arrest and transport to Rome and his house arrest in Rome. And here you'll see, if you follow the black line on the map, the route of his first journey. To me, this is what makes the book of Acts so rewarding to read and also a little bit challenging. Uh, but rewarding because it's a reminder that the gospel and the church spread in actual historical places, many of which you can still visit today. So when reading the book of Acts, it's a good idea to have a map you can refer to because the names that the Bible uses and what we call those places today, like specifically country names like Turkey, are going to be different. Anyhow, the pattern we see is that Paul and his traveling companions would go into the Jewish synagogues first. The Jews would get the gospel message first. And these were towns outside of Israel, remember. The whole area was part of the Roman Empire. It was still heavily influenced by Greek culture, the worship of Greek and Roman gods, and of course, emperor worship. So wherever they went, they were likely to encounter a mix of people. Some were very familiar with Jewish culture and Old Testament prophecies about the Messiah. Other people not familiar with those things at all. So there was this cultural divide that had to be bridged and it had to be done sensitively. Although Israel was God's chosen people, uh, Jesus was the Lord of the Jews and the Gentiles. God was showing himself to be a universal God, not just a national God. So Paul was dealing with people who already considered themselves chosen. Those were the Jews. They were on the inside of religious ritual and faith and practice. But he also dealt with some people who considered themselves believers in God or gods, but they weren't immersed in the realm of Jewish practice. Maybe they called themselves spiritual but not religious. Hmm, sounds like today. And then there were people who were simply skeptical or uninterested spiritually. Even back then, before modern times, even when belief in God was the norm and cultural, there were people with lackluster or non-existent faith. Sometimes we're tempted to think that if Christianity could just gain cultural favor, it would reignite people's personal faith. But my experience has been uh, when you travel to like a majority Muslim country or you go to regions in America that are heavily churched, it is still not a monolith. You still find people who are just going through the motions. And that sets the stage for personal and community revival because God doesn't live in the motions. God doesn't live in the rituals. Rituals can help us keep our faith growing and vibrant, but they can also become dead exercises. And all of this is to say when Paul would go into the Jewish synagogues, what he was looking to do was to complete the story that those people already knew. So here he is in chapter 13 in Antioch, Pisidia, which is modern day Turkey. And he is invited to give a word of exhortation to the Jews and the God-fearing Greeks in the synagogue. And if you want a great summary of the Old Testament story, just read Acts 13 verses 16 through 22. And then the story of Jesus gets summarized in verses 23 through 31. So there you have it. In less than a chapter, you've got the Cliff's notes of the entire Bible. And Paul brings it home for them in verses 38 through 39. Therefore, my friends, he says, I want you to know that through Jesus, the forgiveness of sins is proclaimed to you. Through him, everyone who believes is set free from every sin, a justification you were not able to obtain under the law of Moses. And that's it right there. That's 
the relevance of Jesus. Jesus is the missing link, if you will. He's the piece that makes these people right with God. The justification that they were not able to obtain under the law of Moses. That was good news back then. We know because a few verses later, it tells us the next Sabbath, nearly the entire town gathered to hear Paul speak about it again. Good news back then. Is it still good news today? For people who are stuck in religious boredom, or they're skeptical, or they're unbelieving, is justification, being set free from sin, still good news? I suppose the answer depends on who you're talking to. Objectively, yeah, it is good news. But subjectively, maybe not. Maybe to your friend or neighbor down the street, eternal life is an ultimate concern, but it's not a present concern. And it gets into a question about the most effective ways to evangelize. We don't want to be weird as we share our faith. We don't want to be, uh, the expression is so heavenly minded that you're no earthly good. But if we ourselves are so rooted in the here and now, the moment to moment existence, that we ourselves are just focused on the weather or the price of gas or coronavirus policy or the stock market or politics or professional sports or the current season of The Bachelor or whatever it is we focus on and talk about. If we're there and we have no mind for ultimate concerns, no room in our thoughts for God, then how are we going to lead others there? And Paul will demonstrate in coming chapters how to come through different windows to bring the relevance of a Savior into people's life situations. But we are now in the season of Advent, headed towards Christmas. And Christmas has come to mean different things to different people. But for us as Christians, it's a season of waiting for the Messiah. And when the angel Gabriel prophesied to Zechariah that he was going to have a son who would be John the Baptist, Gabriel said that son would make ready a people prepared for the Lord. So part of yours and my being ready is refocusing ourselves, not only at Christmas time, but at all times on these matters of ultimate concern. We need to live like spiritual things matter to us if we ever want to have hope that they'll matter to somebody else. The story of Paul and Barnabas' travels continues tomorrow with Acts chapter 14. We'll see you right here.